with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday, August 3rd, 2022. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, we are loaded to bear. Four bear, two bear. Don't ask me. Uh, someone corrected me last time, but I forgot. Mustafa Bayoumi, columnist at The Guardian, will be here. This piece, A Journey to Guantanamo. Jacob Silverman, author of the upcoming book, Easy Money, Cryptocurrency, Casino Capitalism, and the Golden Age of Fraud. We'll be here to talk about the Christian extremist bigot who runs Gab. Then lastly, we'll be talking to, I guess, libertarian uh, gubernatorial candidate, Larry Sharp. First, a massive turnout in Kansas where the state votes overwhelmingly to keep abortion rights. Meanwhile, in Missouri, Eric wins the GOP nod. (laughs) You have to say it in all caps. Yes, all Eric. Eric! Uh, Eric Schmidt, that is. And um, sadly, Trudy Bush Valentine beats uh, Lucas Kunst. Meanwhile, an Oath Keeper... QAnon guy wins the Arizona Republican nomination for Secretary of State. That position runs the elections, incidentally. Great news. Jesus. And it is a a big day, more or less, overall in multiple states for the Trumpistas within the Republican Party. APAC money defeats Andy Levin in Michigan. The Senate passes the PACT Act. Biden to sign an executive order enlisting Medicaid in assisting out-of-state abortions. That's a pretty big deal, particularly based upon what happened in Kansas. The DOJ challenges Idaho's new abortion ban. Nancy Pelosi leaves Taiwan. Atlanta cancels a music festival for fear of guns. And the Pennsylvania Supreme Court upholds no excuse mail-in ballots. Overall, pretty good day uh, yesterday. All that and more on today's program. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Like I say, it is uh, uh, it is it was a pretty good day uh, yesterday. But of course, today is. And I'll let Emma Vigeland, who coined the term for today. The wordsmith herself. It. Yes. Hump day. How did you come up with that? Oh, man. I don't know. It's just creativity. It just flows through me. I'm an artist. Don't you understand? Yeah. No, I get it. I just, I, I'm just so curious how you get your ideas. Uh, I mean, my process is too uh, important to me to share with you. So I understand. I understand. I can't give everything to my boss. Oh, we started late today. Oy, I didn't realize that. Someone just wrote in, why you uh, no start on time? Um, sometimes, well, Have you ever watched the show before? Well, we should also say, uh, part of the problem is, in this office, we have a new air conditioner that periodically shuts the power down. So when the power all goes down, then I've got to reboot all my computers. In, in, Which in is get- a big ask for Sam's computers, because he's got about 900 tabs loaded up at any time. It's absolutely true. The RAM is humming. It's, yeah. It is. It's nuts. And this computer, apparently from 2012. 
I uh, found that, that the other day. That's why 10 years. <laughs> all of my peripherals don't work with it anymore after it upgraded to like Mojave or whatever it was. Again, a that. reminder that we are just swimming in peacock money. Uh, well, uh, it's it's tough to disaggregate the peacock money from the uh, Soros money. Right. So, all in the same pool. Uh, Folks, big win in Kansas. Just a couple of, of stats. In terms of turnout, as of uh, this morning, the Kansas primary turnout was at 910,000 people. Just to give you a comparison, in 2014, that primary turnout was 330,000. We're, we're using 2014 and 2018 as comparisons because they're off-year elections. No, president, uh, no presidential uh, uh, primary. So in 2014, it was basically a third. In 2018, which, remember, record-breaking numbers for Democrats and Republicans across uh, the, the country in terms of turnout for the, um, the general midterm election, off-year election. But for the primary, it was 473,000, almost half, like it almost doubled. And maybe by the end, when they count all the ballots, it would have basically doubled um, the turnout. That's crazy. The 2020 presidential election was only 1.3, almost 1.4 million. So there was a tremendous turnout. And there the it was also like we even talked about this yesterday in terms of the ballot. You had to vote no to protect abortion rights. It was a double negative, and that seemed to have been purposeful given some of the texts that were sent out to confuse voters, and it didn't work, it which didn't is work. amazing. What was uh, the, the end result? What it was like the most recent is basically 60-40. Yeah, which it was is, 59-41, says New York Times. Which is a landslide of epic proportions. I don't know if I've been alive uh, in the country where, there, where there's that type of divide. I mean, even I think like, you know, Reagan's big landslide, I think was a little bit less than that, um, if I remember correctly. So it's a big deal. And here are um, pro-choice, pro-abortion voters and activists in Kansas. tonight what was at stake was our constitutional rights and our freedom and so um, you know a coalition of voters across the political spectrum came together today and voted no they voted no um, to protect their neighbors um, they voted no on changing the Constitution um, and really um, you know demonstrated our free state roots Uh, a big deal, a big deal for other reasons aside from, OK, and, and, and look, the uh, the big takeaways from this and, and, and yesterday I was saying, you know, you get, we need to be cautious and reading too much into this. But there are some really material implications here to this. Turns out that uh, almost 50 percent of the abortions performed in Kansas are from other states. Yeah. Where abortion access has been limited and now in some instances completely um, uh, prohibited. And when you combine that fact and that it's that uh, Kansas is going to continue to be able to provide abortion services for women in uh, multiple states uh, in that part of the country. Kansas borders many states and it's it's really just an oasis in the center of everything. Uh, Joe Biden is going to sign an executive order today that is going to direct his health secretary um, to allow states, essentially to invite states to apply for Medicaid waivers that would essentially allow for them to treat out of state uh, women who are seeking an abortion. 
and Kansas has a Democratic governor, my my understanding is that you do not need, and I may be wrong about this, we'll get a double check on this, but my understanding at this point is that you do not need any type of legislation to get that waiver, that that is something that would happen within the executive branch of the state government. And so a, uh, a Democratic governor, in the wake of that, um, of that vote, is going to seek that waiver, I would, I would suspect, from the federal government. And it will at least, you know, the material implications of that vote are uh, pretty big. I will also say, despite what I said yesterday, if you had told me that they would double the turnout, that it would be 60-40, um, I would have told you the one sort of like political implication. Again, hard to extrapolate as to what this is going to mean in the midterm election because you don't know how those voters are going to vote, you know, uh, Republican or whatnot. But definitely this not a is, bad sign. It's definitely <laughs> not a bad sign. But what it will definitely do, I believe, is it will encourage a lot of Democrats running for office, particularly in purple districts or districts that, you know, maybe have gone Biden four or four or five in the general election. But in an off year election <clears throat> might, you, you, you know, the advantage might be to the Republican. They're all going to start talking about abortion rights a lot more now. Do it. Because this is at the very least the way it's going to be interpreted. And I think it would be a mistake to interpret it in any other way is that this is a winning issue. Uh, and if you box in your opponent, um, uh, it, it's going to only help. And you mentioned the uh, Kansas already was a bit of an oasis for people seeking abortions uh, in bordering states for, for many years. Um, and now it just really cements that history for itself. Like, you know, what was the... Uh, conflict between uh, Missouri and Kansas in the lead up to the Civil War oh, about, about over slavery. Slave states, yeah. Right. And Kansas was on the right side of that. They seem to... Um, Most or some Kansans. Right, m- right. right. But there is like a, a, an interesting history between Missouri and Kansas and they share the border and they share Kansas City as well. Um, and people, I would imagine, are going to continue to flock to Kansas as this sanctuary state, honestly for this kind of health care. And so, I mean, honestly, Kansans, I think, should be should be really proud, uh, really proud today, because this is going to be hopefully something that is replicated in other states where there is just a bit of a, a democratic toehold where you can protect women in bordering states as well. So and people uh, who can get pregnant for Kansas. This is for you. <laughs> I think that is the first time we have ever blown the show far for an entire state. Yeah, also yeah. a rock chalk Jayhawk. Um, we will uh, be talking uh, in just a moment to uh, Mustafa Bayoumi, uh, columnist of The Guardian, about his uh, journey to Guantanamo Bay. Uh, but first, an oldie but a goodie. Oh, my God. Yes, of course. Uh, Emma's super psyched. It's 2022. We have high-speed internet. We have portable air conditioners. We have celebrities going to space. Um, We're going to have more electric cars soon. And yet, people still clean their bums in the way that our Victorian brothers and sisters did. With toilet paper. Yes. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you can step into the 21st century and upgrade your bathroom routine. Start washing your bum with Hello Tushy Bidets. Uh, and why? Because uh, doing it the old way is so a hundred years ago. Yeah. As it were. Really not, a long time style. ago. Uh, but it also turns out to be, uh, based on my personal experience, I don't want to get too uh, graphic, but um, a much, it's, a, it's revelatory. And, and, and when you start thinking about it, it makes sense, right? You get dirt on your hands. You don't take a dry piece of paper and wipe it. You wash it with water. Yeah. Right. So basically what you do with the Hello t- t- Tushy Bidet, and it's an attachment. It's First off, it's also super, super easy to install. 
If you can change your uh, toilet seat, you can install a Hello Tushy bidet. It washes your bum with fresh water. Like I say, much better clean. You, you spray, or it sprays, and then you pat dry. Uh, it installs in less than eight minutes. It cuts your TP use by 80%, saves you money, saves paper waste, and uh, the next time we go into lockdown, for whatever it's going to be, um, you never have to worry about that. Hello Tushy has cleaned over 1 million happy bums. So I want all of our listeners to have clean bums. I think uh, everyone, that's not, that's obvious. Uh, so visit hellotushy.com slash majority. You get 10% off plus free shipping right now. That's hellotushy.com slash majority for 10% off. And tag at Hello Tushy on social media so they can celebrate uh, your uh, clean bum with you. Uh, as always, we'll put uh, links to that in the uh, YouTube and podcast descriptions. And as always, it's your support that makes this show really possible. Uh, if you want to help us survive and thrive, become a member today at jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you get the free show free of commercials and you get the fun half. And today on the fun half, uh, we're going to have, I, I, you know, I, I suspect we're, it's going to be a little bit of a back and forth discussion with uh, Larry Sharp, uh, the would-be libertarian um, uh, candidate uh, for governor in this state. But first, I want to welcome, uh, oh, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll be talking to Mustafa Bayoumi. He's a columnist at The Guardian uh, on his recent trip to Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Uh, joining us uh, is Mustafa Bayoumi. Uh, he is a, a, a columnist for uh, the Guardian paper and uh, uh, the Guardian site, I guess now. Uh, and uh, he writes about his journey to Guantanamo Bay. Uh, the piece is entitled A Week in America's Notorious Penal Colony in the Guardian uh, on July 11th of this year. Uh, Mustafa, welcome to the program. Thank you, Sam. Um, let's just start with, and, and you provide this um, uh, uh, quite early in the piece, just the breakdown of like who's been there, who continues to be there, and under, um, uh, I guess, the, their, their classifications, their categories, uh, it, it, you know, because it's, it really is stunning. Just that one paragraph enough is, is really one of the most sort of like upsetting things um, you know, and it's been a while. We barely hear about this uh, now, but uh, just give us those 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 numbers, if you could. Sure. So talking about Guantanamo Bay, there have been something like 780 uh, detainees throughout the system. Uh, the, it's now over, over 20 years that the prison has been active. Of those 780 today, um, 36 remain at Guantanamo. 10 of those 36 are now under the military commission system. So they're actually you know, in trial, but those trials have not actually moved to the trial stage yet. 20 of them have been cleared for release, but we're waiting on countries uh, to accept them. And so the, uh, the US government should be actively involved in that. Two of them have been convicted. One of them who has been convicted has actually already served his, and completed his sentence, and yet he is still in prison, essentially, at Guantanamo Bay. So really, it's 21 people who should be uh, resettled somewhere else. And then there are the so-called four forever detainees. They've never faced any trials. The U.S. government says that they're too dangerous to release, but does not have enough you know, evidence or wherewithal to actually uh, 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 set up the uh, trials for them. And, and can you just talk a little bit about for the the conditions that people are in in terms of solitary confinement, how it, I think you wrote that 
over 23 hours a day of solitary confinement, some of these prisoners? Well, it's really, it's changed. and It's gone through various iterations over the 20 years. Uh, and it also changes depending on the profile of the prisoner. There are so-called high value detainees and so-called low value detainees. And the high value detainees are more or less essentially those who the CIA had tortured at black sites around the world. And then they were brought to, to, to in 2006, 2007 to Guantanamo Bay. Uh, and that's when the military commission system was first set up. And so they had the most uh, uh, horrific conditions. Many of them had the most horrific conditions of confinement. Now, 20 years later, in fact, they're really, many of them are facing really difficult health situations. You know, they, they have all kinds of ailments that are uh, the consequence of being in jail for 20 years uh, or, or also the consequences of having a legacy of, of, of torture uh, on their bodies at the same time. So uh, the conditions of confinement may have eased uh, in recent years for some of them, but that doesn't mean that their their health or their situations are actually any better. I also I just want to um, uh, uh, note um, the youngest prisoner at Guantanamo Bay that we held there when when he was brought there was 13 years old. Um, and 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 to reiterate that of the first 571 uh, detainees that were there. Um, 86% of them were not captured by U.S. troops. They were handed over for a bounty. And w subsequent to that, I don't know that we can, we can say that about every one of those 86% of 571, but there are many, many, there was many, there was a lot of reporting uh, at that time or subsequent to that that suggested these were arguments with, you know, sort of either tribal arguments or arguments with, uh, you know, sort of personal arguments. And people just said, this is a good way for me to get rid of this person and get them out of my life, essentially. Um, so, you know, but there's almost like two separate issues here, right? One is how messed up the, the you know, how messed up maybe the, the process in which people get there is. But then just simply the existence of this type of site, this type of sort of prison is distinct from the fact that maybe there were people who didn't even belong to be there. Um, so uh, walk, you, uh, tell us why you were there uh, ostensibly. I mean, uh, you were there for a specific thing, but, uh, you know, obviously relating all of the, uh, the procedures there. Yeah, so you can't just you know hop on a plane and go to Guantanamo Bay. Uh, you actually have to be invited. You have to go through and be cleared, and it's a it's a very rigorous process by the Pentagon and the U.S. government. Uh, and you have to be you have to have a reason to go down there at this point. And so my reason was as a member of the media, as a journalist, uh, I was there to observe some of the pretrial motion hearings for the military commission system. And so the military commissions, as I was saying, there are 10 people who have been charged and who are facing these uh, pretrial motion hearings that will eventually turn into trials, although it's been year upon year upon year of these pretrial motion hearings. Mm -hmm. But when those happen, you know, on the calendar, that's when they, uh, they allow journalists to come down and to, and to view the proceedings. But the other reason why I wanted to go down there, too, was just to keep it in, you know, in, our, in our consciousness, to keep it alive, to, to, that we should not forget that Guantanamo Bay exists. I mean, I feel like somehow the U.S., American society seems to have a hard time keeping like more than two things alive at the same moment in a way, right? And so it, especially once COVID hit, it felt like the whole war on terror was just forgotten. Uh, and it seems more important than ever that we remember that the war on terror not just existed, but continues to exist. And one way that it continues to exist is the existence of Guantanamo Bay itself. I also think that, you know, uh, the existence of Donald Trump, which led to sort of a reformation of George W. Bush, um, also, you know, is uh, partially to blame for the complete, almost uh, erasure of, of Guantanamo in our national consciousness, because that's a reminder that he set up this this basically this torture regime uh, that extended across the globe uh, and and um, created an extrajudicial sort of like um, zone, if you will. We and I, and I think, you know, I, I think for many of our listeners, they will know this. 
But there's also we have a lot of younger people who uh, many of whom were just, you know, uh, tiny children when Guantanamo came into the news as a, uh, a site for these prisoners. Will you tell us just briefly the history of Guantanamo Bay? People don't realize it's literally part or it's it's part of the island of Cuba, I guess. Uh, but it's not just to house um, these prisoners. W- will you just give us a little bit of like, sort of like the, those basic background? Sure. This is the oldest active U.S. overseas uh, military base in the world. It's been uh, active since 1903. You know, ever since in 1898, the United States uh, took over Cuba, as well as the Philippines and Guam and other places, Puerto Rico. Uh, and then um, in 1903, they established the, the base and that they've had a, uh, an agreement with the governments of Cuba over the years since then. Uh, even in the early years of the Castro regime, after the Cuban Revolution, uh, there was even coordination in the very, very beginning. But then after that, there was no coordination or, or no acceptance. Anyways, the U.S. government pays a small check to the Cuban government every year that uh, Castro and his and the, the following uh, regimes in Cuba never bothered to cash. Uh, but so it's been it's been around for a very long time. It's actually just it's a it's a very it's a 45 square mile naval base, uh, which in the small corner of this naval base is this now very notorious, very infamous prison. But the naval base far exceeds the prison in terms of its history. And in fact, one of the interesting things is the way in which that history seems to kind of almost replicate upon itself. Like, for example, some of the workers who work at the naval base themselves are overseas contract workers, and many of them come from the Philippines, which was also uh, an American uh, uh, property from the 1898 uh, wars as well. Um, so there's this way in which you're at, at Guantanamo, even though you're on Cuban soil, it's this weird history, sort of like, you know, not Cuba, but America. There's a McDonald's there, for example. It's the only McDonald's that you can find on Cuban territory. Uh, it's just this, it's a very, very surreal, sort of bizarre place. And uh, speak to why the, um, I guess it was, uh, was it, was it, what, what do they call it? Uh, was it X or is it Justice, uh, Camp Justice? Why, why that was placed in Guantanamo? Because this this was essentially a theory that was propagated by the Bush administration that they could act with essentially with impunity uh, because it's it's nowhere on some level. That's absolutely right. Uh, the idea, the legal idea in the beginning uh, with the Bush administration was that somehow Guantanamo Bay would be outside of the boundaries of the U.S. court system. So the most important thing for them was actually to make sure that the U.S. courts didn't have uh, access and therefore that there would be even no even claims of habeas corpus, no even legal claims of people who are detained to say, why am I here and, and fight, fighting their detention, even to see the allegations against them. And so from the very beginning, the establishment of Guantanamo Bay for the war on terror was an attempt to say to the world that we do not need to follow the rules of warfare, the rules of law, the rules essentially of of global civilization. And, you know, if I may, just for a brief moment, I think that that kind of reckless disregard for the rights of individuals and institutions that we saw during the Bush administration, that really is the connection to the kind of reckless disregard that we see for the rights of individuals and institutions with the Trump administration that we see today. And I think that it's really important that we don't see those two things as being separate, but that we try to connect the war on terror to this very uh, uh, profound moment of American fascism, you could say. And so uh, that, I think, is often lost on people. Spencer Ackerman has written a book uh, that I, I can't recommend enough for people to read that that I think sort of examines that, uh, that very premise, uh, that much of the sort of unwinding um, uh, that we're seeing in this country is a function of these sort of like principles that emanated out of the war on terror. Um, and and, and, I, and I, I, I think it's a pretty compelling case. Um, once you start to sort of like bend these principles and these sort of like bedrock principles of our uh, of our system, you know, sometimes you can't bend them back. Um, and, 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 and I, th- I think that's a very good uh, point. And you also like the, the history of that place is so nuts in many respects. Uh, you talk about 
there, there was a coup in uh, 91 in Haiti, which, um, you know, I don't know how much it's, uh, you know, how much is out there in terms of this country's involvement, but it was certainly the uh, a, a coup of the first democratically uh, elected um, uh, uh, president in, uh, in, in Haiti. Um, and there was a lot of Haitians housed at Guantanamo Bay. That's right. In fact, they were on their way to the United States to try to claim asylum. Their lives were threatened. They, it, was, uh, it was a dangerous period. And the U.S. did not want their feet to touch the American, to touch American soil. They, they didn't want them to go through the U.S. legal process for asylum. So instead, they came And just to remind people, idea. once you place a foot on American soil, both American law and international law says you must, you must at least process their claim for asylum. Correct. And so instead, they thought, well, let's divert them instead. So thousands were then diverted. Where to? To Guantanamo Bay. And in fact, to the very same naval station where I was at, to the very same naval station that now houses this prison. Not only to the same naval station, but in fact, on an old abandoned airfield called the McCullough Airfield. Uh, in, and not only on that airfield, but that airfield is the same place, exactly the same place where the military commissions are being housed as we speak right now. So there's there's a history to that to that territory. And the history, too, I think, is it, when you talk about making connections, placing it in Guantanamo Bay, which you know was a section of land that we got before the Castro regime, and um, obviously Castro and, and the co uh, communism there, uh, it, it's, it, the, the war on terror can be viewed as an extension of, or a child of, the Cold War and uh, our colonial empire internationally as well. It's almost a thumb in the no or, or a thumb in the eye of Castro and Cubans in general um, as a way of you know an extension of that history as well. You know, I think that's a, such an important point, and I think it's also reminding us about the way in which the American military archipelago is so grandiose. In fact, the United States has way more military bases than any other country at all. Something like 175 military bases around the world in about 75 different countries. That's, yeah. that's a much larger footprint than any other country anywhere around the world. People should read David Vine's book about that, by the way. That's a very um, yeah, important point, I think. And, 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 and just one more point about those, uh, the, the Haitians, like the establishing that that base does not constitute U.S. territory. Um, I mean, because if, if a child gets born on that base, uh, right? I mean, d don't they have citizenship, uh, U.S. citizenship, um, uh, ostensibly because they're on that base? Yeah. Um, and so it, it, it functions as like an annex of the United States in some ways, but not in others that are, you know, convenient to um, all of the worst elements of, frankly, of, of what we do in this country. Um, but let's talk about the, the, the commissions. This is the, um, talk about the various like, sort of iterations of these judicial regimes that existed on Guantanamo. And then also, uh, please just recount what happened in 2013. I remember this uh, and it was bizarre in terms of like, all the power goes out and we find out like, oh, this is, it, it is really more despotic, I think, than anyone could have imagined. And it got very little attention too, frankly. Uh, but but, but uh, walk us through the sort of iterations of the commissions. Yeah, so the military commissions uh, were set up first in 2006 and then struck down and then reestablished in 2009 under Obama. And uh, they basically, they're their own legal system. It's a separate legal system, separate from the you know, American civilian law, also separate from the Uniform Code of Military Justice, although they're based fundamentally on the Uniform Code of Military Justice, but with key differences. And one of the differences, really the fundamental difference is uh, at the heart of it, is that the military commissions are set up essentially to preserve the, uh, the uh, actions of the CIA and others from accountability, right? Because they were involved in all kinds of torture, torture which is against international law, 
torture which is against U.S. law, torture which goes against treaties that the U.S. has signed. And so the military commissions, uh, while they're there ostensibly to, pr to provide either guilt or innocence for those who are being tried, are also there to try to shield the CIA from any kind of accountability. And one way that we have an example of that is exactly what you were saying, what happened in 2013. So the military commissions are set up, if you're observing them, with a 40-second delay. And so this is very strange if you're there, for one thing, because you know if you're there as I was there, you're there behind us, uh, uh, some some glass that is soundproof, and the, and then the sound is then piped in 40 seconds later. It's almost like watching a really bad you know uh, lip synced movie or something like that, right? Um, and you end up just watching the proceedings on a TV screen that's above you that's actually in sync, although 40 seconds later. What happened back in 2013 was that there's a red there's a red um, you know dot that lights up if the U.S. government decides that something if the judge or the the, the security officer in the in the courtroom or the prosecution feels that there's something that's going to be uh, um, uh, you know dangerous that's going to be said that's going to spill a national security secret they will then mute the proceedings for the people who are watching the proceedings on that 40 second delay. So what happened in 2013 was suddenly that light went off and nobody knew who had who had triggered it. And so the judge looked at the prosecution, the prosecution said they hadn't triggered it, the, the defense and everyone looked at the at the judge, the judge said he didn't do it, the, the, they, they looked at the security officer, he also didn't do it. And only then did it really become clear to people that they were not the only ones who are watching these trials, and that in fact, the trials were also being observed by no, under, no other than the CIA themselves remotely. And not only were they being observed, but the CIA had the ability to control what was going on, what was being heard, what evidence was being you know, understood to be part of these trials. So the CIA has actively uh, been involved in, in coordinating and in limiting uh, the access to these trials from the very get-go. And, and nobody associated with the trials, prosecution, judge, defense had any idea that that was that was the case in terms of the CIA under what authority like i mean is there any is there a are the you know these are presumably military commissions right the CIA is not does not have authority under as far as i know under the the, the uniform code of, of of military justice like under what authority does the CIA is there a was there a statute like like I wonder wonder what authority do they have the ability to literally stop these proceedings? You know, this is what happens when you have essentially a brand new legal system that is, is there set up without that much oversight. You know, without without uh, and, and with other other aims at its heart. Uh, you know. Um, I think I think it's very clear that the military commissions were set up by the military with the hopes that that all of the people who are involved would just sort of slapdash say, OK, here's a trial and then we're going to get some quick prosecutions and then we're going to get we're going to make everything nice and tidy and people are going to be able to go home. Well, instead, what happened was that especially the defense lawyers, especially the JAG defense lawyers, the military defense lawyers said, well, you know what? My oath is to the Constitution, not to the military, not to George W. Bush, not to the CIA. My oath is to the Constitution. And so they are the ones who started fighting back and started, started clawing back and started saying, well, we want to know what this evidence is. We want to know where this evidence came from. We want to know, was this coerced evidence? What is this hearsay evidence? All of the, They started challenging all of the elements of the military commission system, which I think many people would see as rather, if not fully undemocratic in, all, in, in any other kind of context. And they're the ones who have been pushing and pushing and then, in fact, really ultimately preserving our rights as American citizens through the, the system that is deeply flawed in Guantanamo. Has there been any civilian uh, defense attorneys? Because I know there's a, there's a bunch of those as well that have come down uh, that and, and, and some that have continued to go there uh, okay. after 20 years. Um, and um, have they attempted to. Uh, like uh, particularly in terms of the CIA's role, have they attempted to sort of like, I don't, I mean, I, I don't know where you would go. I guess you would go maybe like the 11th circuit or maybe to the Supreme court and say, you know, under what authority does the CIA have the ability to shut this down? Yeah. I mean, their fundamental uh, for the, uh, whether you're a civilian or a, um, or a military defense lawyer, I mean, your allegiance is really to uh, uh, your client and to try to get a good uh, defense for your client, right? 
But yes, it has gone to the Supreme Court. In fact, there was a recent case uh, earlier this year that the Supreme Court uh, openly admitted that uh, torture had happened to Abu Zubaydah, uh, among others, at Guantanamo. Uh, and it was, took a long time for the United States government to admit that torture has happened. And, and that flies in the face of, uh, and, and really does put some members of the CIA probably at some legal risk for that to happen. But that's what, that's what we need to have happen. You know, that's exactly the kind of accountability that I think is, is uh, Guantanamo cries out for. Lastly, um, Barack Obama entered office with essentially a pledge to close Guantanamo. And they made an attempt. I, I think people can differ as to sort of like how vigorous of an attempt it was, but it was largely shut down by the Senate, uh, both Democrats and Republicans. I mean, I think Democrats controlled the Senate at that time um, when the, the real big push happened to close Guantanamo because there was some notion that these um, people being held there and, you know, we've already broken down the numbers of like even the ones that, you know, supposedly we think are dangerous um, is minuscule, that they were somehow. Supposedly, the fear was like, you can't, you know, you can't bring them onto American soil because. Uh, maybe there would be some type of like, you know, a prison break or like Lex Luthor would come down or this <laughs> and that. I mean, that was ostensibly what we were told, but it really was more, I mean, was it really, and, and this is the strange thing about it. You would think that the administration would be more sensitive to the idea of setting up a precedent that these people deserve rights because now they're on uh, American soil than senators. Senators, you know, I mean, do you have a sense of like what was really at play there and, and, and how that, what was the actual dynamic that took place? Back in 2009. Yeah. 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 I mean, well, pretty quickly after Obama, then, you know, it was one of the first two things that he said as a, uh, when he, on the very first day of office that he was going to close Guantanamo. And also pretty quickly from the very beginning of when he was elected, I think you had Mitch McConnell say that we're going to make him a one term president, too, and like be very negative about anything and that they're not going to work with him at all. And so but yes, you had also they passed the law the shortly thereafter that said that you can't actually bring people from Guantanamo um, to the U.S., even not only not only just for trial, but even to house them here. Although one person from Guantanamo was already in the U.S. federal prison and he still remains there. Um, so uh, it's actually been really, it's made life very difficult um, for a, lump, a number of people because what that also means is that the U.S. government has to find third countries uh, also to, um, to house the people who also been cleared for release. And we don't even know when the, if these trials actually happen for the 10 people who are being per, uh, currently tried, if those trials ever do happen and they're convicted, where are they going to serve their sentences? Um, and in fact, some people are saying that now the U.S. government is involved in plea negotiations so that there won't be trials, but there will be guilty pleas coming forward from Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and some of the other people who are there for the 9-11 attacks. And th the death penalty will be taken off the table and instead that they will be um, um, given life imprisonment. But that life imprisonment will be, and they, they themselves want this, the, the, the men who are in Guantanamo, they would prefer to be in Guantanamo Bay than in one of the supermax prisons that we have in the United States. Because their lawyers have told them that if you go to a supermax prison in the United States, you spend something like 23 hours a day in solitary confinement routinely. Whereas in Guantanamo Bay these days, they actually have more freedom, more daily kind of liberty, if you can imagine, than people who are surviving in American supermax prisons. Um. Well, uh, Mustafa Bayoumi, uh, uh, columnist at The Guardian, The Peace, uh, we will put a, a link to this, uh, your journey to Guantanamo. Uh, really important work uh, to, to keep this in the forefront of, of people's minds to the extent that we can, because it really, I think it, it has sort of resonated through, uh, through the past 25 years or 20 some odd years. And, uh, and, and I, I think a lot of things that we've done there have had implications here that we, we don't really fully uh, understand. So I really appreciate you coming on and talking about it. Thank you very much for having me. All right, folks, we've got to take a quick break. And when we come back, 
We'll be talking to Jacob Silverman. He is the author of the upcoming book, Easy Money, Cryptocurrency, Casino Capitalism, and the Golden Age of Fraud, which he co-authored with Ben McKenzie. But he's here to talk to us about the CEO trying to build a white Christian secessionist tech industry. We'll be right back <laughs> after this. We are back, Sam Cedar, Emma Vigeland on the Majority Report. Uh, joining us now, Jacob Silverman. He's the author of the upcoming book, Easy Money, Cryptocurrency, Casino Capitalism, and the Golden Age of Fraud, which he co-authored with Ben McKenzie. Uh, here uh, for a piece he's written for the New Republic on the CEO trying to build a white Christian secessionist tech industry. And uh, we should also say... Um, this guy's uh, also been dabbling in politics, uh, having been a apparently a paid consultant to uh, Mastriano, the guy running in um, in Pennsylvania for uh, the governorship uh, on the Republican ticket. Uh, Jacob, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. So I should tell you right up front, I have not been on Gab. Um, and I'm not sure. Has anybody in the office been on Gab? Have you been on Gab? I'm a truth social guy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, we, yeah, I would never, I would never, uh, uh, but tell what is Gab? Well, Gab itself is, is part of a company called Gab AI, but that has a bunch of different products and, and companies beneath it. But really Gab is a, a Twitter clone that's designed for wing users. Uh, really anyone who has a, a very rigid, uh, and, almost fundamentalist view of free speech. It's very light on moderation uh, and the audience it tends to attract. And as I found that it actively solicits is really a right wing, frequently bigoted, anti-Semitic kind of audience. Um, people who have been kicked off Twitter or Facebook or elsewhere. And it plays off of those grievances also against mainstream tech and the, the perceived uh, censorship in mainstream tech. So it's an island for misfit racists. <laughs> Absolutely. And they have now, you know, they're growing. Uh, they have a video site. They're trying to do a, a sort of PayPal clone. They're basically, tr as I argue, trying to replicate a lot of the traditional tech infrastructure, uh, perhaps on a smaller scale that they can afford, but, um, but in parallel to mainstream tech so that they can control everything and not really have to be subject to the whims of a big tech company or to even the government. Um, what, 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 let's just start with this. When you say light moderation, like what do they, uh, what do they say is, what do they not allow? Is there anything they don't allow on the, uh, uh, like on their, on their platform? From my understanding, I think they, they follow the law. law so they, they try to remove speech that's, uh, incitement, for example. But, you know, before the, the massacre at a Pittsburgh synagogue a few years ago, the shooter posted on Gab and I believe was egged on on there. Um, and, you know, and then the, what the Gab founder did was he and the CEO, Andrew Torba, is he then, you know, he denounces the shooting uh, on one hand and calls it a crime, an act of terrorism and brags about his uh, cooperating with law enforcement, but then reaffirms that Gab is sort of an open place where any, almost anyone can say practically anything. So I think, you know, if you found content there that actually does violate the law or perhaps is reported in some way. Uh, I mean, I think there's still some reporting mechanisms. Then those sorts of things uh, might be removed. But the company is constantly talking about having as light a touch as possible and that they really see themselves as a refuge where people can say whatever they want, including you know, hate speech. Uh, what, give us a little sense of like Torba's history. What, what was he doing before he decided to set up Gab? Well, uh, from my understanding, he, he's basically a, a serial tech entrepreneur who, who when he started Gab, uh, uh, the company started early Trump administration, late Obama administration, I believe. And that's when he sort of found his vision for what he wanted. 
I mean, you could, what makes him, I think, interesting, and I, I say that almost in quotes and with the caveat that a lot of what he says and does and promotes is quite disturbing, is that he is very dedicated to this vision of a Christian nationalist country and a separate tech industry that, that caters towards those values. Uh, of course, very right wing, very much uh, free speech above all else. So that is the plan he's been trying to put into action for five plus years. Uh, I would argue in some sense he is doing it. Uh, I don't think he's going to necessarily start some revolution, but he uh, and we don't really know the finances of his companies um, there. It's very possible he's not making any money, but he is creating a space and certain tools that people on the right are looking for, especially those who have been kicked off of of mainstream uh, networks. And, you know, you see the same thing in something like True Social or Parler, but I would argue that they, they're they doing it differently and with different degrees of success or failure, uh, I'd well, say. Well, will you, will you contextualize it in that way? So, like, how many users do they have relative to a Truth Social or Parler? Um, how uh, How is their... What is their moderation like? How is their audience different? Like, I mean, is, is, are these... Is Truth Social and Parler and uh, and Gab are they they competitors essentially? Is that what's going on there, or they're basically competing with one another? They don't have much shot at competing with with mainstream uh, social media platforms. Uh, they actually might be in some ways competing more with something like Discord or Telegram, where things are a little more freewheeling and where you you do have uh, people on the right or people in, in sort of right leaning interests like cryptocurrency are going to those platforms. Um, so yeah, true social is a disaster. Um, it doesn't really work from any perspective. The finances are a mess. And I think just the fact that Trump is in charge with Devin Nunez and it's a SPAC and all sort of line up all the bullet points. And you can see that this thing is probably destined for failure and not many people are using it. Parler has attempted to legitimize itself more. They're, uh, they kind of have classed up their, design their re their they've softened some of the rhetoric they're definitely still maga affiliated but they're doing a lot of nfts and melania's nft collection and they're sort of trying to become this this kind of more respectable maga tech company uh that can appeal to kind of mainstream america through mlm style marketing how how many uh i wonder if is if trump is a little bit annoyed that she's doing her nfts on a rival site but aside from that <laughs> Um, what, like in terms of numbers, like how many, yeah, no, sure. how many, how many users are on Gab? How many users are on Parler and, and how many are on Twitter? Just so that we get a sense. Do, do you know? Well, uh, uh, certainly on a, on a platform like Twitter, uh, there are a lot of debates, especially with Elon Musk lately over how many are bots and things like that, but uh, they can safely claim a, a few hundred million active real users, I'd say probably per day. I mean, something like Facebook or or instagram is dealing in uh more than a billion users per month so then you get down to to gab where the numbers aren't very reliable but last year they claimed i believe to have around four million users so and, and i would be surprised if that's a real number i i think some of these sites are managing to sustain themselves because people are looking for a way out of the perceived woke tech companies and everything like that and there is some right-wing money coming in. Uh, for example, Rebecca Mercer, yeah, a daughter of Robert Mercer. I feeling Mercer's would be involved in something yeah, like she this. Pro she provided initial funding for Parler. And I wouldn't surprise, I believe she has pulled away, but it wouldn't surprise me if she still has her hand in there or some of these other companies. I mean, there is right-wing money to be had to kind of sustain some of these operations. Um, they Certainly with True Social, it's, it's pretty much a mess. So I don't know if you can trust any of their, their numbers, but... At, at best, you're looking at a few million people a day, very active, engaged people. But it's it's more like 4chan than Twitter. But well, how we, would, uh, oh, sorry, but how would Gab like? Where would their revenue come from? So Gab doesn't. Uh, Gab has paid services that they're starting to offer, like a paid membership, uh, paid video services, and stuff like that. They don't seem to be as keen on advertising, but they're trying to offer paid services, and they also solicit donations. And when I hear Mercer's, right, then I start to think uh, Peter Thiel as well, right? He's an investor in, in Rumble, I believe. Mm -hmm. do you, does he have his hands in any of these other platforms or you know, what, what's his involvement in some of this right-wing alternative ecosystem? Rumble's a good one to bring in. Uh, he's certainly involved in that. 
which is a video platform that that is gaining steam. And anytime, you, basically, you have a powerful rich guy to give one of these platforms some runway, it, it's it makes a huge difference because then one, they can outspend and outlast their competitors, hopefully. And uh, I think a couple of these sites are going to go down. And there is arguably an opening for competitors to YouTube that cater towards the the MAGA audience, broadly speaking. Uh, so I expect Rumble to to be a force, probably more than these other ones. There's also um, you could arguably fit in uh, Colin or Get Colin, as the website is. Uh, it's a podcast network starred by um, David Sachs, who's from the PayPal Mafia, who uh, has been involved in the recall of Chase Abudin in uh, San Francisco. He funded a lot of that. So he, I would put in sort of this constellation that's that's broad. So parts of it go together, but uh, of kind of reactionary tech figures who are trying to start uh, very moderation light or moderation free, free speech devoted platforms that really stand in opposition to what they see as the censorious liberal tech establishment. And, so and you kind to, of have the Peter Thiel wing and then the yeah. Christian fundamentalist wing is what I said. And just to follow up here, how are these even accessible when you have app stores like Google app stores or Apple app stores shutting them down? I mean, I guess you can get there on your desktop, but is that, I mean, what are the alternative methods of even accessing some of these kinds of sites and apps? Right. That That is also an issue. And you know, that gets to an issue of gatekeepers and the, the role that Google and Apple play in, in their app stores. I mean, one sort of wrinkle with all this or thorn in this, these kinds of discussions is that, you know, some of these problems that they're responding to, uh, this far right uh, tech media is real. I mean, you, there are problems with moderation, how it's handled. I wouldn't argue that it's uh, in a, a deliberate effort to censor right wing views, but these systems have problems. The concern, the Facebook's concerns are not always in line with its users' concerns. So, um, but anyway, to, to answer your question, uh, for example, Parler was kicked off of the app stores, both of them. They went back on the Apple app store in exchange for introducing some moderation. They are not on the Android store, the Google Play store. You can do what's called side loading, basically load it yourself. You can go on parlor.com and they promise you can see the unmoderated version. Gab, you mostly access through the web. So a lot of the stuff does end up having problems kind of meeting people where they're at, which is on their phones. Uh, and there and that those are some of the gaps also that these companies are trying to trying to fill in, I suppose, because they want to be as accessible as possible. So, as you say, Torba is a um, is a is a Christian nationalist. Uh, he signs his newsletter post Jesus is king. Uh, which is, you know, uh, I guess uh, fine if you're into that type of thing. Um, there's a lot of violent anti-Semitic comments on on Gab, uh, and I'm surprised they don't get advertising from like sort of rival uh, white nationalist groups uh, that uh, want to. Uh, f but but let's talk uh, just a little bit to the extent that you know any. I mean, you don't uh, bring it up in the piece, but it turns out this guy Torba was a unspecified paid consultant to the Republican nominee for governor in Pennsylvania. Do you know anything about that? Like, what what would he be consulting? Um, it, it's a good like, question. Like, let me put it just like, if I'm hiring consultants around me um, who have never run for political office, right, I may be looking for them for, like, what kind of constituency they can bring to my campaign. Um, I mean, what, like, do you have any ideas here? I, I certainly have an idea of what it says about Mastriano and maybe what it says about what the Republican Party sees as as I mean, I don't know how this decision was made, but what they see as who they do want to reach. I mean, you ha in general, I, I would think someone hires Andrew Torba to do some kind of media or social media consulting. I mean, the, the announced fee, I believe, was five thousand dollars, but but maybe there's more to it. But you hire someone like that to reach a far right audience on social media. That's his expertise. Uh, one thing that I did read was that uh, for a while, it seemed there, I think it was denied by by Gab, but there was a report that for a while, every new Gab user was was automatically following Mastriano on Gab. Uh, certainly every new Gab user does have to follow, or at least last, last I checked, had to follow Andrew Torba, which which is why he has a couple million followers. So not but, just Jesus is king. <laughs> 
<laughs> right, right. And Torba is too, apparently. But, um, you know, it's essentially to funnel the Gab audience to Torba, I think. I mean, Torba is also promotes various politicians on his platform. I'd have to check to see if he's specifically reposted or re retweeted, you might say, uh, from Mastriano. But the connection is clear there. And what's, I mean, disturbing, I think, is that there's no real hesitation, it seems, about having that connection. And I honestly, it's also in Pennsylvania where the Pittsburgh synagogue massacre, of course, happened. I mean, there's just a lot of reasons why you wouldn't want to associate with this guy or tout him as some sort of advisor. He's openly anti-Semitic. I'm not convinced that the fee was sort of like just a way of signaling to people like I'm like I, I am associated with Torba. Like, I mean, I, I, yeah. you, I, I mean, I think it's sort of a not just like the uh, about the material benefit he gets. I think he just wanted it out there that I am associated with this guy. And all those white supremacist types, uh, they they speak in secret messages like that. And they are trained to understand what something means and you, what you can't say publicly. Right. Even if you're associated with someone. Yeah, the various kinds of dog whistlings and, re and references. And I think. One lesson, certainly, of the Trump era, but also even just post-January 6th is until we have real accountability, there's not much uh, of a political cost in a lot of these races to just keep going far right, ultra MAGA, whatever you want to call it, or just be openly racist or bigoted or conspiratorial. In fact, that seems to activate uh, a certain base. And um, so, you know, there's a little bit of, of fear or of fear out there, I think understandable, actually, about sort of QAnon aligned candidates and stuff like that. But what's also especially scary is that there's just no real cost or objection to, to to being public in that way. They don't seem to be very concerned about any sort of electoral blowback. Jacob Silverman, uh, author of the upcoming book, Easy Money, Cryptocurrency, Casino Capitalism, and the Golden Age of Fraud, which you co-authored with Ben McKenzie. And um, we will link to your piece, The CEO Trying to Build a White Christian Secessionist Tech Industry, at uh, majority.fm. Thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, folks. We're going to head into a special version of the fun half today, uh, wherein um, I will have a little conversation. Emma, you want to take Emma, we'll take a little. We'll, well, I mean, I'm just going to, I feel like you want to, you got this handled. Well, we're, I'm going to, you know, there's a, I'll uh, be a, here. a, a, uh, a would-be candidate uh, for uh, governor in New York State, a third candidate. Uh, one of the problems that, and I do think this is an issue, and it's why uh, one of the reasons why we're having him on, uh, is Andrew Cuomo, in an attempt, I think, ultimately to hinder uh, the uh, Working Families Party, um, made it very, very difficult to get on the ballot for the gubernatorial race. Uh, and, um, uh, we will talk, uh, to, uh, Larry Sharp about that. Uh, but we're going to, uh, take a quick break and then head into the fun half, uh, wherein uh, we will, we'll talk. We'll just, uh, remind you, you can, I am the show at, uh, by picking up our app at majorityapp.com. It's free. It's on both, uh, Google and, uh, iOS platforms or Android, I should say. Uh, and, uh, also, we may take calls, 646-257-3920. We shall see. But we'll be right back after this into the fun half. But, Matt, what's happening in the Matt Lecky and Media Universe? I heard you got a big guest We had a big night. guest last night, Emma Vigland. You may have heard of her. She was on Left Reckoning for the first time. And Whoa. she stayed in for the uh, post game too, where we Whoa. talked a little bit about politics. So, uh, we did. The juicy post game, I would say. Patreon.com slash Left Reckoning to uh, get that. We also talked about Kansas. Uh, and how I think that, like, Tim Heelskamp, the guy who was paying for those texts um, trying to fool people about the abortion, I want to see that guy do time. Like, I don't know if we need to do new laws or if there's laws in the books. It doesn't look like there's laws in the books. Laws in the books seem to be against, like, um, you know, collect, helping people vote. Right. Um, but that sort of lying, like, and investing in lie media like that, that should somehow be uh, illegal, at least some kind of fine. So uh, I went a little bit authoritarian and anti-free speech <laughs> last night. So patreon.com slash left reckoning. All right, we're going to take a quick break and uh, head into the fun half, and then we will be talking to Larry Sharp, a libertarian candidate for uh, governor in New York State.
three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now. And I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now. And I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now. But I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. The majority Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. Fun. Matt. You. Fun. What is up, everyone? Fun. No, me key. You did it. Fun. Let's Point go, there. Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Fun. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint you. everyone. I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women. Stop talking oh, for wow. a second. Now let me finish. Where is this coming from, dude? But, but dude, uh, you want to smoke this? Um, seven, eight. Yes. Um, all right, me. This Yes. Uh, is this me? Is it me? It is you. Is this me? Hello, is this me? I think it is you. Who is you? Oh, no sound. Every single freaking day. What's on your mind? Sports. We can discuss free market.